Do you know, Hector, that the Italians worship cars, and none more than the Ferrari? Ever since the first car rolled out of the Maranello factory in 1947 with the prancing horse on its badge, Italians have had an ongoing love affair with the Dino, the Tetrosa, the Daytona and all. And a Ferrari rally attracts hundreds of admirers. You can imagine what a stir I caused though when I rolled up in the works roadster. Talk about entering a hornet's nest. Still, you have to admit that en masse, Ferraris are impressive, but I still think British is best. This is the town of Orvieto, ancient and beautiful, nestled high on its rocky precipice in Umbria. It still looks much as it does in Turner's painting in the Tate, as I'm sure you Ferrari owners know. Yes, it's true for the eagle-eyed, my number plate did indeed change to KF1 when I went to see the rally. But I hadn't come for the Ferraris. Orvieto has a lot more to offer than just cars. Connoisseurs come for the great white wine, art lovers for the magnificent Gothic cathedral. They say if you try both at sunset, you'll die happy. But I had come in search of something a little more esoteric, a rather special little fellow, as Italian as ice cream and adored by millions worldwide. It was taking me some time to track him down, although I did come across some clues along the way. I counted them out, and I counted them in. Or was it the other way around? Anyway, enough of these cars. I reckon I'm on the right track now. Do you know where Pinocchio lives? Right there. This was no setup. This man really does exist, and he's been making Pinocchios in Orvieto for over 50 years. He's made a lot of children very happy, and a lot of near adults too. isn't it? So is the church. Orvieto white wine, splendid stuff. Now, what could be more wonderful than a light, simple lunch of veal, truffles, marsala, cream and butter? Nothing, could there? So, no further ado, let's pop our pan onto the gas, a little butter into there. I might have to speak up a bit on this, Dennis, because there are cars going by. We couldn't close the square. It is a public square and we're just boring it for a few seconds. So the fillet of veal into the pan with a bit of butter and fry it gently on both sides just for a couple of seconds. Then the next thing we do, chop a couple of wild mushrooms up into small pieces, little porcinos, and pop them into the butter too. A little bit of pepper on the veal now. Oh, there's a Vespa going by. Everything's going by here. It's bound to go by, isn't it? But this is the middle of the most beautiful square in Orvieto and we couldn't resist filming here, despite the problems of traffic and noise. It just has to be done. Then, a really good bit about this dish is a little drop of dry masala, a wonderful Italian wine.
Let that simmer away for a second while I chop up some truffles. Very generous truffles. We'll pop those in. Now, back up to me please, Dennis. It's very important that the meat doesn't overcook, so we lift that out and put it onto a warm plate while we finish off the sauce itself. So the veal goes onto there. Now a little cream, a little fresh cream. Like so. Stir all the juices really well into the cream. The truffles will be giving flavour to the cream in the masala, as will the little mushrooms. That's excellent. To really enrich it, we'll tip in a little bit of butter, whisk that round. This is coming really well now. Mm. It's quite delicious. It's quite delicious. The Italians are very fond of sage, a little bit of sage, a little salt, a little more pepper, a quick stir. Oh, there's the village bus. All the school children going back to work or whatever school children do. No problems there. Keep stirring to the last possible minute. Don't serve it until you see the whites of their eyes. And then we lift this over and pour this wonderful sauce. Onto the veal like so. Hold that for a second, Dennis. We've got another couple of little things to do. An exquisite flavouring, another tip onto this lovely sauce. Some little bits of grated lemon zest. And finally, a little tiny bit of parsley. Wipe the plate. A bit of blood coming from the veal is very important because that mixes into the dish. And there we have it. Veal orvieto. Truffles, wild mushrooms, cream, masala, butter, scrumptious. You sharp-eyed gastronauts might notice that the sauce was beginning to separate. Yes, it's true, I'd had the pan a bit too hot. Anyway, enough of all that, I'm heading for the Umbrium Lakes, Lake Tresemeno in particular, the largest lake in central Italy. I'd come for a spot of fishing, and of course it was another early start and I got a ride in the boat with one of the local fishermen. The lake is uniformly shallow. It's only six metres at its deepest point, and until quite recently it abounded with fish. But this generation of fishermen may well be the last. The lake's been desperately overfished in recent years, and now there aren't enough mature fish left to provide the living it used to. Many people who watch these programmes think I go on holiday to these exotic places and a film crew follows me around while I do what I want to do. It's not at all like that. This morning, I've been, all I've been trying to do is go fishing, catch a few huge perch, and then cook them on a charcoal grill for breakfast. Have I been able to do that? No, I have not. There have been cars going by, aeroplanes flying over the top. I've been smuffling my words like I did then, muffling my words. Everything's gone completely wrong. So instead of talking lovingly about perch and things, I'm just going to cook them. And look at the poor little things. They're only three or four inches long, quite against the rules in England. But after all that, we are in Italy. So whack some olive oil over them with some rosemary. I'm going to stick them on this charcoal grill. And notice those of you at home who cook at home, the charcoals are white. That's when they're at their hottest, that's when they're at their best, not when they're still black. We pop those on there for just a few minutes each side. And I hope when I come back to these when they're cooked, I should be in a much better humour. and a little bit of pepper as well. 
and a little bit of sea salt. I must say, they look stunningly attractive. Ah, this is much more like it, much more like it, Dennis. Back to me a minute. I am cheerful again. The little fish are cooking away nicely. My wine is tasting really good. I'll just finish these dishes off, these fishes off. <laughs> Turn them over. Squeeze of lemon juice all round. A little bit more salt all round. A little bit of pepper. Shred a few rosemaries over them just for flavouring. And there, as a result of this, you have a happier Floyd. Don't they look wonderful? Umbria doesn't seem to have the smart reputation that Tuscany's got, and happily, as a result, it's wonderfully uncrowded. So if it is a bit of a backwater, it's a very easy-going, happy backwater. It's not the largest region of Italy, but it has a fascinatingly textured landscape. Expensive cars is wonderful fun. You don't get to see the countryside too well. So I thought I'll take the train, have a look around. A nice gentle leisurely trip. A bit of fun. Umbria is known as the green heart of Italy, and its dreamy rolling landscapes have inspired generations of painters. But all good things come to an end, and the train finally pulled into the station at Perugia. I decided to go and have a little explore, which for me meant finding a restaurant, a kitchen, and a chef whose work was worth watching. I found all of those. I have to tell you, you've been watching that. That is the work of a skilled, dedicated cook. Swift, efficient, delicious, loving. It's fabulous. Anyway, the dishes are being served now. So drift away somewhere, Dennis, and we'll get them all onto their plates. And then the final exquisite touch. Some grated fresh truffle on the top of this very simple, superb tagliatelle. Al burro. Magnificent. Let's go and eat. Well done, Dennis. That was first class. Big, fat, loving close-ups. You can't go wrong. And so to the town of Castello for a spot of bargain hunting and soak up a bit of the local culture. Non so. Italians, like the rest of us, love a good bargain. They love nosing through the bric-a-brac, haggling, talking, walking the kids, just generally having fun. It's something I like too. Although on this particular occasion, I found nothing that took my fancy. And then the music made me realize I must press on to the next cooking sketch, if you know what I mean. I'm bored with spinning around the ingredients. So we're gonna try a new technique now. Dennis, come in, we're cooking a duck. This is the duck, okay? And the first thing we do to the duck is roll it in some seasoned flour. Not too much. There we are. And then into this pot here, which I've already got melted butter and golden onions, okay? We pop the duck in, 
that side, and then that side. And we let that sizzle away for a few moments to let it turn the gas up to get it really golden brown. Chuck that out of the way. This duck is a very special duck. First of all, it's a free-range duck. That is to say, it's allowed to paddle around, it's been in water, eats fresh corn and stuff like that, never been inside a cage. But we're cooking in the most unusual way. Interesting to me to discover here that they like sweet and sour duck. I don't know the Chinese that did that. Not so at all. It's a duck fried in onions, roasted with stock, and then the stock is enriched with vinegar and sugar and everything like that. Anyway, while that's browning off, I've got some other little bits and pieces to do, which is to chop up some mint. Picked from the chef's garden right outside the door. Nothing has changed, really. We still beg, borrow and steal kitchens. So we chop up the mint. Reminds me of my childhood, you know. Back up to me, Dennis. In my childhood, on Sundays, on those wonderful days when we had roast leg of lamb, the first thing you had to do in the freezing cold was go and pick the mint from the garden, take it back. And in those days, you had a little funny machine you used to roll over it. Anyway, here we are, back chopping mint 40 years later. Right, mint chopped. Let's have a look back in here. This is getting quite nicely golden now, as you can see. That's really quite good. Now, I think what we might do is just pop in a little bit of extra pepper on top of that. And now that it's golden, a little bit of salt. OK. Then the next phase, back up to me, please, Dennis. I got my chums here to make me some lovely chicken stock. Now, all you need is a few ladles of that into the pot. Like that. Don't worry if you hear voices in the background at all. This is a working restaurant, this is a working kitchen, and we have begged and borrowed everything here. So if there is a bit of noise off, off at the back, don't worry about it. OK, so we have our onions, our duck, and chicken stock. Next thing happens, lid goes on, and we pop it into the oven, depending on the size of your duck, for up to two hours. This one I'm going to cook for about one and a half hours. So, a bit tricky here, because I'm not used to this kitchen, but in this goes into the oven. Motorbikes going by, obviously, because it's lunchtime, and they're all headed for the restaurants and osterias. OK, good. That goes in, as I say, for about one and a half hours. When it's cooked, I will then make the next bit of the sauce. So, there we have it. An hour and a half, nearly two hours, just under two hours. The duck is beautifully pot-roasted. Yeah, pop that onto there. Now, Dennis, bear with me for just two seconds, please. I want to go over the technique again. We rolled the duck in seasoned flour. We fried it in butter with golden fried onions. We sealed the duck all the way around, then poured in some good chicken stock. We put in a couple of bits of ground cloves, put it in the oven and let it simmer and pot roast as half simmering, half roasting for nearly up to two hours. Now, we have to finish off the sauce proper. So if I know how to use this oven, here, in here, if I can have a good close-up, not very interesting, because it's just sugar and water, OK? And we have to melt that down so we have a nice, rich syrup. Now, it's like watching paint dry, watching syrup being made, but take my word for it, that has to be just cooked away. Back up to me just for a second, please. That has to be cooked away until it's getting slightly golden, but not so it turns into treacle, because if you pour this into the other sauce and you get treacle balls in it, you'll be very, very cross indeed, and I will look fairly silly. I don't aim to look that way if I can possibly help it. Now, in the meantime, back into this pot here, where our main sauce is, I'm going to add a dash of vinegar, because remember, this is duck sweet and sour. So a dash of vinegar into there. This is the sour bit. OK. Let that bubble away. Maximum heat. Over here, look. Down again, Dennis. We're getting this really well together, I think. This is just coming on beautifully now. We'll just let that take a slight tint of colour which at the bottom it is, you can just see it faintly browning. And what we now do is transfer it in one fluid movement into here. And then we let that bubble away and reduce until it becomes rich and unctuous. I'll just test it. It's looking good. Stay with that for a moment, old bean.
And then with a final garnish of mint, there you have it. Anatra al agro dolce. Sweet and sour duck. And now, Hector, I'm off to a secret rendezvous under strict orders not even to tell you where it is. All the other seven million people that watch this programme, all I can say is it's beyond a CC, and the object of the exercise is mushroom picking. Now, if all that sounds a bit bizarre, a bit mysterious, you have to be aware that picking mushrooms is a national Italian pastime. Not only that, it's highly competitive and very rewarding and the best spots are a closely guarded secret. Everyone, men, women and children, are all into mushroom picking. These people are experts. Happily, they know what they're doing. They've been at it for years. But if you don't know your mushrooms, it's very unwise to go picking, let alone eating anything you find growing wild. Now that's what I call a mouth-watering sight. Mushrooms. Go into any market and you'll find whoppers like these. In fact, I couldn't resist buying a couple myself for my next cooking sketch, which I should be saving for something very special. But in the meantime, I'm off to a beautiful vineyard just outside of Torgiano. Notice the Italian's getting better. So, grape pickers do what grape pickers do. They pick grapes and make wonderful wine. The wine they make here, which is absolutely fabulous, is called Rubesco. It really is splendid. Well, I'm going to cook beef and wild mushrooms in Rubesco wine for the grape pickers. So, here we go. Very, very simple. The diced meat goes in to the frying pan full of oil. That has to be very nicely browned. And as soon as it's absorbed some of the oil, we season it well with some pepper. My experiences here in Italy have shown me the Italians don't use a great deal of pepper, but I like it very much, so it's going to have some. And a bit of salt goes in, like so. Another quick stir. And we can transfer the meat to the main cooking pot. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Now some splendid red wine to cover it. And then for a complete change, because we've never done this before, we're going to do a dish including tomatoes. <laughs> Fresh tomato sauce. Goes in like that. Then we chuck in a little sprig of sage and a sprig of parsley, like so, and a couple of whole pieces of garlic. Then that simmers away for about an hour and a half before we add the next delicious bit of the ingredients to it. So I'll pop the lid on, have another slurp and see how the dear old grape pickers are getting on, I guess, working their little fingers to the bone, making us happy producing brilliant wines. This is one of the major wine-producing areas in the world. There are a lot of grapes. And it may look a pleasant enough way to spend the day, but you wouldn't catch me doing it. Those buckets are jolly heavy. 
I'm much more used to just lifting a bottle. Not only that, it's a race against the weather. Should the rains come, the crop could be ruined, and a year's work is literally down the drain. Mm, the dry white wine they make here at Torgiano is fabulous. Anyway, back to the cooking. Let's see how the stew's getting on. Fantastic. The wine's reduced, the meat is tender, ready for the next phase, which is putting some fat, some ham fat, smoked ham fat, cured ham fat, into my pan over here. This will give me a wonderful flavour for the wild mushrooms, which will be going in in a moment. Stir, stir, stir. A bit smoky, but the pan's very hot. It'll calm down in a moment or two, I can promise you that. Gives a terrific flavour to stews. Right, wonderful mushrooms. <coughs> Excuse me, I had another slurp, I coughed there. Mm. Wonderful wine. Right, mushrooms go in next. Sautéed for just three or four minutes until they're tender. Like so. Oh, lost one. <laughs> Great fun this is. Mmm, that smells so good. Little salt and pepper. Well, this will put lead in the elbows and pencils of the wine pickers, I can tell you. A really bumper dish. Then just a little bit of sage goes in to flavour the mushrooms. A little bit of fresh parsley, not to cook it too much. Sorry about the sizzling there, Echo, but that's the way it goes. And then the final thing is to combine these wonderful mushrooms cooked in ham fat with sage and parsley into the beef. A little gentle stir around for them to mix in like so. And there you have Umbria in a pot. As the great pickers finished their long day, I packed up my bits and pieces, rounded up my motley crew, and we decided it was time to head south. <laughs>